Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19 Heavenly Father, we humbly embrace our calling to share your love and truth with the world. Empower us to be faithful disciples, spreading your message of hope and salvation to every corner of the earth. Remind us that we are never alone in this mission, for you are with us always, in every moment, until the end of time. Strengthen our resolve and fill our hearts with your love, so that through your words and actions, others may come to know the grace and truth found in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying with me today. You're listening to The Jesus Podcast, sagas from the gospel told like never before. Remain here to immerse yourself in the drama and wonder of Christ's story. If you want to partner with us in our mission to bring the Bible to life in new ways, follow this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to. Doing so will keep you updated, but also help us get discovered by more people. That way, we can reach the whole world with the story of Jesus. Jesus and the eleven disciples reclined at a small table, enjoying a meal and laughter. The room was small and humble. The wooden table was old and rickety, and the fireplace was worn and weathered from years of use. Yet there was joy in the room, and captured within the four walls was a majesty unseen, deeply felt. The disciples' laughter shook the room as they reminisced and dreamed about the future. Jesus was among them, listening, laughing, eating, and praying. Their joy was complete in the light of Christ's resurrection. Now, there was only one thing left for Jesus to do. Clearing his throat, he lifted his voice for them to hear. He gestured to Mary and Salome, who were reclining at the table beside them. You didn't believe those who proclaimed my resurrection, did you? The eleven, feeling convicted and embarrassed, shook their heads. Jesus gave them an assuring smile and said, My dear children, you have seen me and believed, but blessed are those who have not yet seen and still believe. The disciples raised their cups in acknowledgement of the blessing and drank. Master, what are your plans now? Matthew asked. We are eager to follow you wherever you go. The disciples leaned in to hear Jesus' answer. His resurrection was mysterious, and Jesus' intentions were still unclear. Jesus looked at his followers. They were devoted and eager. He knew what they were expecting. They were expecting a revolution, an upheaval of Rome, and a reformation of the temple. Yet Jesus' revolution was for the heart, not the government. He did not rise again to restore one nation to prominence, but the entire world to God. With love in his eyes and tender strength in his voice, he said, Go into the world. You will proclaim the gospel to my creation and reconcile their hearts to God. You will be my ambassadors on the earth and proclaim the coming kingdom. People who believe in me will be saved. However, many will reject me and be condemned. Where do we begin? Peter asked eagerly. Jesus' attention was fixed on Peter. His eyes reflected pride in his dear friend. Peter saw his future reflected in Jesus' gaze. A future of strength, power, and persecution. You begin with faith, Peter, Jesus said softly. There will be many signs and wonders you will behold, yet you must wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. He will guide you into all truth. With him counseling you, you will be able to cast out demons, speak new tongues, and be immune to the poisons of this world. You will lay your hands on the sick, as I have, and they will be healed. Yet it all begins with faith. Jesus placed his cup on the table, and gathered the disciples into a warm embrace. Meet me on the mountain above Galilee in the morning, he whispered. Then, just as he had done several times before, 
he vanished. What does it mean to live in light of the resurrection? How do we imperfect people on this side of heaven live lives that echo eternity? We begin with the Great Commission. Welcome to the final resurrection episode of the Jesus Podcast. Don't worry, we have hundreds more stories for you this year, but this is where the resurrection story draws to a close, where Jesus ascends to heaven to be with the Father. Before Jesus leaves, he gives his followers a final command, a commission. This calling extends to us today. These are the final acts and words by Jesus here on earth. We can't afford to miss them, so let's dive in. The followers of Jesus rose the following day before sunrise. The serene calm of dawn was interrupted by a cacophony of people gathering at the base. 500 people had come to see Jesus, each individually called to bear the message of hope within them. The crowd followed the 11 disciples up the mountain, each step taken with anticipation and fear. Peter, James, and John were a few strides ahead of the rest. They had once climbed up a mountain to see Jesus transfigured in glory. Now as they reached the summit, they didn't quite know what to expect. At the top of the mountain, with the wind whistling overhead, was Jesus. He stood there looking out at the sun, radiantly peeking over the horizon. He turned back to his followers and smiled. His robe and hair flew back in the wind as he gestured for them to step closer. The Son of God stood there on the mountain's edge. The radiance of the morning sun was nothing in comparison to his glory. Small slivers of light began to shine through his skin like flickering flames. Hundreds of them bowed before Jesus. They sang his name and proclaimed his mighty works to the heavens. Hallelujah, they sang. Hallelujah to the Son of David. For the first time in history, a group of people gathered to worship the risen King. They sang his praises and spoke of his glory and grace. Their songs of hope and salvation would resonate for a thousand generations. Peter stepped forward from the rest. The ground near Jesus was pulsing like a heartbeat. He looked up to see Jesus. When Peter saw him, he covered his face and fell to his knees. He now fully understood he was in the presence of the Most High God, Elohim, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. He was speaking to the great Deliverer the voice from the burning bush, the great I am. He bowed before him and looked up. Jesus, is it time for you to restore the kingdom of Israel? Peter asked. Is it time for you to take the throne of David and claim your authority? Jesus looked down at Peter and walked toward him. The earth beneath him rippled with each step. His voice resonated with the power of God. Authority? Jesus asked with a smirk. He stretched out his hands and said, All authority I have, Peter, give to you. He looked out at his disciples and the hundreds of followers behind them. All authority I have, I give to you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus raised his arms, voice booming with a power more palpable than the wind. All authority in heaven and on earth is mine. I hold the very power of the universe in my hands, the power to transform and save. Jesus' voice grew louder, and the clouds around him illuminated with light. The crowd looked behind Jesus to see the sun holding its place on the horizon. It became impossible to tell where the light was coming from, the sunrise, the clouds, or Jesus himself. Jesus' voice poured forth to his followers like a thousand raging waters. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach others to observe what I've taught you, to love, to obey, to sacrifice, and to serve. Matthew looked and noticed that Jesus' feet were rising above the ground. He's leaving. He and the others ran to Jesus and fell at his feet. Master, no, don't leave us alone here. Fully immersed in the radiance of heaven, Jesus smiled. Alone? Oh, my children, you are never alone. Behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of time. And as he said this, the light fully enveloped him, and he disappeared into the skies like a vapor. The sun's rays fully peaked over the horizon, and the clouds disappeared into the skies. Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, the Great I Am, had gone to be with His Father in the heavens. There He would prepare a place for them. He would map out the course of eternity with them in mind. The King of Kings would be the architect of His kingdom on earth and in heaven. What does it mean to live in light of the resurrection? We live in a polarizing time where battles for political power or division from cultural struggles are rampant. Everyone is trying to aggressively dominate culture with their ideology. How do we as believers, followers of Christ, function in it all? Are we supposed to contribute to the clamoring, the arguing, the debating? What are we supposed to do with this polarized and politically charged time? Jesus came into the world during a polarized and charged time in history, occupied Palestine under the boot of Roman oppression. It seems like an odd time to come in and establish a new kingdom. But Jesus didn't do any of this by accident. He, the Son of God, had chosen before all of eternity to enter in and save his creation at the perfect moment. Looked at from our perspective, it might not seem like it was such a great time. Israel was a conquered country, occupied by Roman soldiers and oppressed by Roman taxes. The Roman emperors who ruled at the time and the Jewish leaders they used as their puppets are remembered as violent, sadistic, and demagogues. There was emperors like Caligula, Nero, Herod. They were all terrible and corrupt men and had their boots on the necks of society. That's why when Jesus is with his disciples as the resurrected king, they ask if he's going to restore the kingdom of Israel. They are essentially asking if Jesus is going to storm Rome as the resurrected ruler of the world and take the throne? The answer is yes and no. Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's not hard to notice that when Jesus is asked, Is it time to take power and create God's kingdom here on earth? Jesus answers that he wants them to preach the gospel, convert people, and to grow the numbers of disciples all throughout the world. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yet today, even among believers with high view of Scripture and Jesus' words in their red-letter Bibles, these sweeping commands from our Savior to evangelize rather than to seek political clout are being brushed aside as irrelevant in favor of other pursuits that are touted as more necessary, relevant, or appropriate to highly charged political culture in which we now exist. We see the church often getting lost in political battles of occupation and regime change. That's the way of Caesar. It's not the way of Jesus. His rule was upside down to the dominating, oppressive, and aggressive culture to the kingdoms and conquerors. He wasn't after the throne of Caesar. To Jesus, that was too small of an accomplishment. He wanted the souls of mankind. And what does it look like for a redeemed soul to go in and conquer the world? Well, it looks upside down to what the world preaches. The world says, hate your enemies, but Jesus says, love your enemies. The world says, strike back, but Jesus says, turn the cheek. The Great Commission charges us to change the world one heart at a time with the character, words, and power of Jesus. What was that evangelistic strategy for the disciples who existed in an even more hostile and marginalized culture? It was to spread the gospel message in any and every opportunity they had. 
They wanted to proclaim the crucified and risen Lord. May we never abandon the Great Commission in order to gain control of culture and seize power. As we have seen, Jesus' disciples were asking when he was going to restore the kingdom of God. Their question was correct, but the intent behind their question was wrong. They wanted to know when Jesus was going to take the throne and establish an earthly kingdom, not understanding and perceiving that the kingdom was going to be established in their hearts, and it was going to be shown in the way they treated the poor and the marginalized. It was going to be displayed in the way they brought in the orphans and widows. It was going to be revealed in the way they preached the hope of Jesus to the masses. It is the great tradition of false prophets who tell us to battle against earthly powers and earthly regimes. But scripture explicitly tells us that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities and ideologies that would hinder people from the love of God. We are to serve, not to rule or to influence in this world, but rather as imitators of Christ, serving the world, lifting it up so it would see and glorify Jesus. What does that look like for us today? It looks like establishing a community of people transformed by the gospel face-planting through life still, but repenting continually, growing and being sanctified into the image of Christ, serving the people around us, extending hands to the broken, extending an encouraging word to those who are lost in despair. The kind of community that's fueled by the power of God, continually glorifying Jesus. In Romans 12, 9, we're told that our love must be sincere. We must hate what is evil, cling to what is good. We must be devoted to one another in love, honoring each other, never lacking in zeal, but with spiritual fervor, serving the Lord and those around us. We want to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and sharing the Lord with people in need, and bringing peace and hospitality wherever we go. We're told not to repay anyone evil for evil, but rather to bless those who persecute us. We're told to feed our enemy when they're hungry. We're told to give them water when they're thirsty. In doing so, we will establish a much greater kingdom than that of Caesar, than that of Rome. The gospel comes equipped with the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus to change hearts. Each individual heart submitted to and changed by the gospel will eventually create a community that looks like the kingdom of God. No other message has either that dynamic or that joy. Today, be people of the Great Commission. Go out there and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them about the character of Jesus. Live life with people, but don't be succumbed to the darkness of the world. Be people of hope, restored out of shame, and mobilized for something great. Thanks for joining us on the road to the resurrection. In our next episode, we are going to explore a new little mini-series through Christ's parables. We'll enter into dramatized parables told in a way that you have never heard before. In so doing, we'll learn more about the kingdom that we just spoke of. How do we exist as kingdom citizens? Buckle up. The Jesus Podcast is just getting started, and it's only going to get better from here.